Hello and welcome back. This is the week 13 lecture. So today we are starting on our final major text of the semester, which is of course Blake or The Huts of America. It's a very strange book, an unfinished book, as we're going to talk about later. Uh, hopefully you guys ordered this edition. This is the one that I ordered through the GBC bookstore. And much like Cabeza de Vaca, it is very important that we have this modern edition put out recently by uh, Harvard's uh, University Press. It's a beautiful scholarly edition with a really good critical introduction written by Jerome McGann, who's an excellent scholar, and he's kind of the foremost leading scholar on Martin Delaney and this novel. So it's really important that you guys have the right edition. If you're reading an older edition, it's going to be quite different. And in a lot of ways, it's going to be missing uh, several things that we need. So uh, hopefully we're all working with the same text and we are spending two weeks on Blake. But let me just say a few things about our schedule. I understand that I gave you guys a lot of reading last week. Like I've said, it's difficult to get through Leaves of Grass in a single week. I also asked you to read some Emerson, and then I posted all of those supplemental texts as well. So that was a very heavy reading load, even by our standards. So I understand that we might still be playing catch up with Whitman uh, or with some of the other texts from last week. So that's okay. I don't want you guys to feel uh, too overwhelmed or stressed out. Obviously, I want everybody to finish Blake, but because we are spending two full weeks on it, it's okay if this week you don't get very far into the novel. It's not terribly long. In this modern edition, it clocks in at a little bit over 300 pages. But I also want you guys to read the critical intro by McGann. And that's a little bit on the long side. It's around 20 pages, that intro, but it provides a lot of really valuable historical and cultural context that I really think we need to have. And I'll be talking a little bit about that context here today. I'm not going to get too far into the book today because <laughs> I'm assuming that many of us are not going to have the time to read much of the novel this week. And that's all right. If you can't do much, at least try to read the critical intro. And take a look at my overview. I'm sort of summarizing a few of McGann's big important points. Uh, but you really need to read McGann. He is smarter than me. And he knows more about this book. And he knows a lot about Delaney. So we, we sort of do need to have a little bit of biographical background on our author here. That's not always super important in my eyes. But I think it is here. Uh, because obviously we're moving into a different kind of text and we're moving into uh, really a different type of author. It would have been very rare, exceedingly rare at this point in time uh, to find African-American writers of fiction. So Delaney occupies a very different social position, obviously, than most of the previous authors that we've read. And we just have to acknowledge, I'm sure we've already noticed, that we just haven't really read African-American authors in this class except for Phyllis Wheatley, who we saw early in the semester. And we did spend some time on her, and I know some of you wrote about her, so it's good that we understand her contribution uh, to early American lit and to understand that she was one of our original homegrown poets uh, so we know that, but we have to jump almost an entire century ahead. We have to move into the late uh, or at least mid 19th century before we can return to an African-American perspective and something that we might be able to call African-American literature. So we need to know a little bit about Delaney and we need to know a little bit about the social and historical uh, you know, conditions that surrounded him and helped to shape him. So 
Uh, this week, yeah, you might just want to tackle McGann's intro and my overview in the week 13 lecture. Uh, I'm sorry, in the week 13 overview. And then if you watch this lecture as well, you'll be in okay shape. You're going to have to do a lot of reading next week in week 14. But, you know, uh, if you're still working on Blake in week 14, 15, that's fine, really, because I've designed week 15 to be very light in terms of our reading load. So uh, it's certainly possible to finish up Blake in week 15, and then you should still have time to read the one short assigned text that I will give you in week 15. Just one short story. Uh, won't take long, and it's the final text that you will be responsible for uh, in this class. So I know it's rough here at the end. I know we're all feeling a little bit crunched for time, um, but remember, you have until the end of the semester to get everything done. I don't mind if we're playing a little bit of catch up here, and as a result of all of those <laughs> uh, factors, I'm basically wrapping up our discussion board. So we're not even going to have a discussion this week uh, because I just, you know, I don't think we're far enough into Blake to be able to have a spirited discussion about it. Uh, and like I mentioned last week, many of you have really already posted enough. Uh, based on my scoring system, you really just need to have 10 posts over the course of this semester as long as you're getting full credit for those posts or close to it because uh, they are worth 200 points total and each week's entry is worth 20 points. So if you do 10, uh, you're actually going to be very close to the maximum number of points that you can gain and that makes these last couple of posts optional. So I mentioned that about Whitman last week. We're going to skip the discussion board this week. And then next week in week 14, I will give you a final discussion prompt. And it will be about Blake. So it will give us a chance to talk about Blake. And if any, if, if any of us are uh, a little bit lacking in our post scores, if we haven't done enough or if we haven't gotten full credit on everything, we can certainly do the Blake post. And even if you have done 10 or more than 10, you can still feel free to post on Blake if you have ideas that you want to share, if you're interested in reading what your classmates uh, have to say, by all means, participate, jump in. I never mind that. But I know here at the end of the semester, we have to kind of prioritize. We have a lot going on. So I'm totally fine if we are shifting a lot of our attention away from the discussions. And now we're starting to think more about our final assignments. So here today, I will provide a brief intro to Blake. And then I want to spend the rest of lecture talking about some of these upcoming assignments. So we'll talk a little bit about the final paper. And I want to talk in a little bit more detail about the proposal and critical summary uh, that will be due at the end of next week, at the end of week 14, which I believe is December the 5th. So that's just one assignment, the proposal and critical summary. That's one assignment with two components. So I will discuss that assignment today, make sure you guys are comfortable with it, but it's already available in the modules. I made it available last week, uh, and it's also uh, available here in week 13, and of course it will be available again next week. But go ahead and read the instructions and I would like you guys to maybe get started on some research as soon as possible. You don't have to have a lot of research done when you submit the proposal and critical summary, but I want to see that you've gotten started. So if you can't get started this week, try to get started on the research next week because obviously our final paper, it is a research paper. It is a literary analysis that will feature research. So we need to kind of get the ball rolling on our research soon. So we'll get to that stuff at the end. I don't think I want to talk about the final exam yet. Uh, 
because that's just kind of too much to cover at one time. We can talk about the exam a little bit more next week in the week 14 lecture, maybe after I finish up the novel. Uh, if we feel like we have, if I feel like we have time, uh, or at the very least, I'll talk about it in week 15, and I will po uh, I will post the study guide that I previously mentioned. And I don't want you guys to worry about the final exam. You don't really have to do a ton of prep for it. You should study a little bit. Uh, you don't really need to be studying right now. Uh, you can study in like a day or two. You know, using your notes, you just using what you've learned in your memory and using my study guide. <laughs> uh, so we can we can do our exam prep a little bit later today. I want to focus more on the final paper and this proposal and critical summary, which is, of course, getting you ready for the final paper. Uh, but let's start by just covering some broad things about Blake and about Martin Delaney. So again, read my overview, uh, and if you read McGann, you're going to get uh, plenty of background info. But I just want to kind of help us to get started here, because this is a very different type of novel, different subject matter to some extent, although we just saw a slave rebellion a couple of weeks ago. We saw it on board the San Dominic in Benito Serena. So I do want you guys to keep Melville in mind as you get started on this new novel because clearly uh, Melville was interested in the idea of a slave insurrection. He was clearly influenced, like I said a couple of weeks ago, by previous real life slave rebellions uh, which took place in the U.S. And we're going to talk more about those today because they are very important and they even get mentioned explicitly at times uh, in Blake. So this is a common discourse. It's not like slave rebellions were not a topic of conversation. It's not like they weren't commonly thought about, talked about, written about, but there was a slightly taboo uh, nature to slave rebellions. Uh, certainly they wouldn't have been discussed in polite society, meaning of course white society at the time, and particularly in the South, uh, because people frankly lived in fear, kind of constant fear of slave rebellions, it wouldn't have been something that would have been you know, talked about in a lot of public spaces, but behind closed doors, <laughs> certainly it was a concern. And the, and the, the you know, the white elites, uh, the white power structure of the South often uh, went out of their way to, uh, you know, suppress the possibility of rebellions. Uh, to, you know, they, they acted very swiftly at any sign of a potential uprising or any kind of attempt at the local black population to, you know, gain rights or gain power of any kind. So there was, there's a lot of politics mixed up with this. There's a lot of elements of social control. And, you know, we kind of already know maybe a little bit of this history, but we're going to learn a lot more over the course of the next couple of weeks. So just a few things to keep in mind. This book, as I've mentioned, uh, was never finished. So kind of like Edgar, I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Uh, Charles Broughton Brown never finished another novel that I taught, but he did finish Edgar Huntley. So we actually don't have a, uh, uh, you know, a point of comparison for this. I don't think we've read anything that's really fragmentary in this class. Uh, Maybe the closest we came was Modern Chivalry, uh, which was published serially over a long period of time, and we only read one small like section of it. But Brackenridge did eventually finish it, I think. Um, or <laughs> actually, maybe he didn't. He might have died while he was still publishing new installments. But uh, this is the first time we're going to have to kind of deal with a weird and complex publication history. Um, I mean, Cabeza de Vaca kind of had a complex history as well, and we talked about that, but at least that text was finished. So, uh, like Brackenridge, Delaney published Blake serially uh, in installments uh, over a pretty lengthy period of time, and he published it in a couple of African-American periodicals. 
I mean, just like everything else back then, the publication world was obviously pretty segregated. Uh, so African Americans did have a few of their own publications, uh, newspapers, literary magazines. Um, obviously, you know they, they didn't have the resources or necessarily the readership uh, that some of you know those white periodicals might have had. But there was a publishing scene within the African American community, and Delaney was a pretty important part of it. Uh, so he lived a very interesting life. I really hope you guys check out the bio, uh, kind of what I give you as far as bio in the overview and what McGann gives you in the critical intro. But he published this in a couple of different magazines, the Anglo-African magazine and the weekly Anglo-African. So those are two different publications. The Anglo-African magazine is one and then the weekly Anglo-African is another. Uh, so beginning in 1859, he started to publish installments of this novel right before the Civil War breaks out, and he continues to publish it up through, I think, 1862, which is interesting because by that point, the Civil War is going on. We're about a year into the war uh, by 1862, or maybe not quite a full calendar year, but the war is certainly underway. Um, but most likely the conditions of the war might have been, I think, are probably was one of the uh, leading reasons why publication uh, maybe ceased. <laughs> um, but yeah, Delaney never really finished the novel. It's not clear if he ever really revisited it, um, but certainly he never really published what we would consider to be a clear conclusion. <laughs> uh, and it was not uh, read widely upon its initial publication. We're actually, it's kind of hard to really find reliable numbers or you know, statistics about readership. Uh, it was largely ignored by white audiences. We know that. But as far as a potential African-American audience, that's sort of hard to determine because as you guys probably know, uh, the majority of African-Americans during this time were illiterate. Uh, of course, it was illegal in most parts of the U.S. for uh, slaves to learn how to read and write. Uh, there was a small but in some places pretty significant free black population. And within those populations, you would find uh, readers, writers, literate uh, people with, in some cases, a fairly high degree of education. But again, they were in the minority. So kind of hard to say uh, how much the book was actually read. But it didn't make a huge dent initially, and it was largely ignored for about a century. <laughs> but in the middle of the 20th century, it was sort of rediscovered. And McGann talks a little bit about this history. And you might notice what was going on, you know, in the middle of the 20th century when this book sort of makes its comeback. We're in the midst of the civil rights movement. Uh, so McGann talks about sort of the, the, the cultural role that this novel played in the 50s and 60s and 70s during some of these important years of the civil rights struggle, times of great change, social change uh, in the U.S., a lot of social upheaval. So I think we can already see how this book might have had a pretty big social impact during those decades. Um, just based on the subject matter uh, and based on Delaney's own life. So again, Delaney's a very interesting guy. He's born, I believe, in the year 1812 in what is now West Virginia. Uh, his father was a slave, but his mother was free. So according to the laws of the time, uh, Delaney was born free. But of course, he, his father was a slave. He had other relatives who were slaves. So he was pretty intimately familiar with the institution. He went on to do a lot of different things. He was a newspaper editor. Uh, he was a doctor. And he was a leading voice in the abolitionist movement. Uh, he was sort of a, 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 a leader uh, within a certain kind of subset, I guess you could say, of that movement. He was a big advocate of black immigration black immigration back to Africa. And this was a pretty commonly discussed uh, s potential solution 
uh, to the race problems in the U.S. Uh, it was sometimes talked about by uh, white politicians and writers, and it was also championed by certain members of uh, the free sort of African American uh, class, sort of you know African American intellectuals, writers. Uh, so Delaney was on board with black immigration. He was trying to sort of raise money and organize uh, voyages to certain places in Africa where he thought African Americans would have a much better chance at equality and living the lives that they wanted to lead. So uh, he wears many hats. He's an important figure. Um, and I don't get into a lot of this in the overview. I can't remember if McGann talks a lot about it, but he, he knew Frederick Douglass. And some of you might have read Douglass in the past. If we're thinking about literacy and the power of literacy, we should really think about Douglass. He writes about learning how to read and write as a young slave uh, growing up in Maryland. So Maryland, not really a part of the Confederacy, but it's, you know, it's a border state. So they had uh, an entrenched tradition of slavery, just like other border states like Kentucky and Missouri, states that did not secede from the Union, but uh, had really strong slave cultures, just like the southern states did. Uh, so Douglas writes about this. Uh, we're pretty familiar with Douglas, but again, just the power of literacy, something that we should kind of keep in mind, too. He writes about how it just sort of changes his whole perspective. Once he's able to acquire literacy kind of clandestinely, he has to kind of fight for it and acquire it on his own because, of course, again, illegal uh, for slaves to you know be able to read and write. So... You know, Douglas talks about once he, he gains these abilities, just, you know, how his outlook changes, his, his whole perspective changes because he can, he can begin to see that there's this long tradition of abolitionist thought. Uh, there's already a lot written. There's already been a lot said about the evils of slavery, uh, the sort of moral bankruptcy of this system that's reigned supreme in the U.S. for so long. So, Douglas, it just makes him realize that he's plugged into this larger movement. He's plugged into this larger intellectual tradition. Uh, it's not just something that he feels. It's not just something that fellow slaves feel or fellow African-Americans. It's something that has been written about by Europeans. It's something that's been written about uh, for ages. So he's part of this larger uh, movement. And I think that's very empowering for him. So that same sort of tradition, that intellectual and cultural tradition surrounding abolition and equality, I mean, Delaney's very much a part of that, and he knew Douglas personally. Um, so in 1847, along with Douglas, Delaney founded and co-edited uh, a new anti-slavery newspaper called The North Star. And later, uh, according to what I've read, he had a falling out of some kind with Douglas, uh, and they kind of split up and kind of went their separate ways. Both continued to be active in the publishing world. Delaney got involved with other periodicals. Like I said, he was an editor in addition to uh, his writing. But also, he and Douglas kind of occupied two different positions within this larger movement. So, and I, I don't really love to use this word because I think it has kind of a negative connotation, but Douglas is sometimes considered by historians to be what we might call an assimilationist, meaning that he was in support of African Americans finding a way to sort of assimilate into mainstream U.S. life. He still wanted, obviously, abolition, equal rights, uh, you know, political rights, but he was in favor of sort of working within the context of the U.S. and trying to, you know, find a better social position within in U.S. society and kind of achieving some kind of harmonious coexistence with white America. Delaney uh, didn't necessarily see it that way. Delaney was more in favor of, like I said, immigration uh, with an E, <laughs> like leaving the U.S. Uh, and going back to Africa, um, where he thought they would have more of a fair chance. So they kind of occupied sort of different political positions, and I'm sure that contributed uh, to that falling out. But 
Um, so yeah, Delaney's, you know, he's an important figure. Like I said, he was a medical doctor. He had a really important role in the reconstruction government after the Civil War in South Carolina. Uh, I put a little bit of info about that in the overview, and I think McGann talks about it too. So he, he travels pretty widely. And he wears many hats. So he's kind of, uh, you know, just an interesting guy. And he is able to bring a lot of knowledge and experience to the table. But one thing we need to remind ourselves about is that Delaney is not a fiction writer by trade. Uh, he does a lot of other things. But this is really the only uh, work of fiction that we are fully aware of. You know, he wrote other things. He wrote essays uh, he wrote sort of scholarly, you know, more academic type texts, um, but he's not really a fiction writer. And some critics will point out that that's a little bit, that's sort of clear uh, as we're reading. There might be at times a little bit of a clunky quality here. Again, I would remind you of Cabeza de Vaca a little bit, not dissimilar to what we saw with the cow's head, right? Not a writer by trade. Uh, so his use of literary conventions might be a little bit lacking uh, in our eyes compared to other more literary writers. Uh, so McGann talks about that a little bit as well. So again, Delaney's a politician. He's a community organizer. He's a newspaper editor. He's a doctor. He's all of those things probably more than he is a writer. Uh, so McGann's talking about this kind of important distinction that we need to make uh, between sort of rhetorical purposes versus mimetic goals. So these are kind of important words for us because he's telling us, and I think this is very true, that, uh, you know, uh, Delaney has like a, an argumentative goal here. We can call it a rhetorical goal. Um, he's not necessarily striving for all of the things that uh, a literary writer uh, of a you know realistic novel might strive for. So um, there's this idea that the plot, you know, the motifs, the characters that we see here, all of that's working towards making a specific argument. Uh, and the argument is we need emancipation. Uh, African-Americans need to liberate themselves. And here's a demonstration of how we can do it. So McGann, I think, even uses the word didactic, uh, sort of labels this book at times or maybe Delaney style as being at times didactic. That word means intended to teach. Uh, with implications of moral instruction. So I think that word probably is appropriate here. Um, but that's not to say that he isn't realistic at times. And that's not to say that he doesn't capture certain aspects of Southern life, certain aspects of slave life very accurately, and at times in heartbreaking uh, visceral detail. It just means that that's not always his principal goal. So again, when, you know, generally when we approach literary fiction, we think that the text has a mimetic function. Mimesis just means like the realistic depiction of the world, of, of life, uh, through art and literature. So we kind of expect mimesis when we are reading a novel. Right. We, I mean, that's kind of what we've come to expect, uh, at least when we're reading literary fiction. Like I said, the kinds of stuff that we're mostly dealing with in here. That might not always be the case with certain types of genre fiction, but that's kind of how we make the distinction. Right. Genre fiction or speculative fiction is often considered to be less realistic, <laughs> less interested in portraying lifelike portraits through art than what we might think of as more literary uh uh, texts. So again, it's sort of about our own expectations. When we get in here, we're going to find some scenes and we're going to find some passages that are very realistic. And I'll talk more about some of those next week. 
Uh, in fact, Delaney's capturing certain things about Southern life and about certain dynamics surrounding slavery that, frankly, very few other American authors of this time period could or did capture. And that's part of what makes this novel really interesting and worth further study because he has an insight and a perspective that was frankly lacking even in well-meaning white abolitionist writers like Harriet Beecher Stowe, who of course is famous for Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was published just a few years prior uh, to this particular book. And in many ways, this book stylistically and structurally is somewhat similar to Uncle Tom's Cabin, another book that's somewhat didactic, uh, Stowe is very much trying to provide some moral instruction, and she is trying to, uh, at the same time, sort of realistically depict Southern life. But she was from Massachusetts <laughs> uh, and probably did not have much firsthand experience of life in the South, particularly life as it pertained to enslaved African Americans. So Delaney's able to offer a sort of granular level of detail that Stowe simply did not have access to. So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. But while that's true, and that's very true in certain parts of Blake, I would argue, especially in certain parts of part one, uh, there really is this focus, on re this focus on realistically depicting aspects of Southern life and kind of also realistically depicting the logistics of trying to plan an uprising. Uh, the sort of drudgery, the hard work that goes into that uh, planning process. But at other points in the novel, I don't think Delaney is as interested in creating a realistic portrait of life. He's making more rhetorical moves. Uh, so you guys all took 101 and 102 at some point in your lives. So you might have remember you might remember talking about rhetoric in those classes, or maybe you've taken a higher level class in rhetoric, but typically, and I'm no rhetorician, um, but we think of rhetoric usually as just being the best available means of making an argument, right? Trying to persuade, trying to convince. So when we talk about rhetorical moves, that's normally what we mean, the moves that authors make to persuade an audience. So uh, let's look for some of those rhetorical moves in Blake because Delaney makes several of them. <laughs> and his protagonist, his main character, is often the mouthpiece for certain political and social views that Delaney wants to express and get out there. So there's this interesting and sometimes a little bit uh, awkward or sort of jarring uh, juxtaposition in this book between the rhetorical functions and the more traditional literary, novelistic, mimetic functions. And I don't know that they always coexist that well. Uh, they kind of take turns, at least based on how I read the novel. But I want you guys to think about those two strands, the rhetorical versus the mimetic, making an argument versus just trying to realistically depict life through art. How do those two things coexist? And when do we see one versus the other? Or maybe we see them working together uh, at times kind of uneasily. But just thinking about some of the larger ideas here, obviously uh, black insurrection or slave rebellions really work as a motif here. Uh, sort of a recurring feature, but they're also just kind of intrinsic to the plot, uh, clearly. So we need to know a little bit more about them, and we need to understand kind of the way Delaney and a lot of 19th century African Americans would have viewed the whole idea of rebellion. Uh, obviously, it would have referred to a, a literal physical action like what we saw in Benito Serino. But McGann points this out in his intro. You know, Delaney, for Delaney, he's making a larger argument here about black immigration. So he's not just solely focused on the idea of a rebellion or an uprising. He has this sort of larger purpose, <laughs> this larger heading that he's placing the insurrection under. Because again, for him, he's trying to make an argument in favor of, 
of black immigration. That's his answer. How do we become free? How do we solve these problems? For him, the answer is black immigration to Africa, at least at this point in his life. He would kind of abandon those plans later in life. But at the point at which he's writing, that's really what he's advocating for. And for him, for Delaney and a lot of other black intellectuals of this time, you know, rebellion or insurrection is really just the first step in a much larger, more complex process. And McGann touches on this, uh, this idea of sort of an African-American self-determination. Uh, this is sort of the first step towards that. It's the first conscious commitment to personal independence. Uh, so it's a necessary step in the mind of Delaney, right? This is this you have to make that move. It is kind of a rhetorical move in some ways, at least when you're trying to get others to do it. Um, the first step is to kind of commit yourself to a notion of personal independence and to say, I deserve it. There are ways that I can achieve it. And then the next step is to take action. Uh, so again, it's a larger process. I'm really oversimplifying it right now. Um, but this is just kind of that first step, that kind of awakening is to, is to realize that it's uh, both sort of morally imperative and possible. But that's something that we're going to see over the course of the book. As Blake travels around and talks to enslaved people, he often is disappointed to find that not all of them want to rebel. Not all of them have a strong enough commitment to their personal independence. They don't have a true consciousness in, the, in, in sort of the language that Delaney might have used. Uh, they haven't come to sort of realize what they are, who they are, what they deserve, and what they can accomplish. Uh, so rebellion, the notion of insurrection, it kind of works on two levels. It does function on a literal level, <laughs> obviously. It is a actual thing that can happen and frequently did happen throughout the 18th and 19th centuries in the U.S. Like I talked about uh, with Benito Serino, slave insurrections were fairly common, not every week, but there were several. And we probably don't even know the full extent of all of them. I'm not sure that all were necessarily captured and recorded in great detail, but we know a lot about many. So they were real things. They were kind of specters uh, for many white Americans, a constant fear. But for black Americans, they also kind of had a figurative or sort of symbolic function where they're not just referring to an actual armed uprising. They're also just kind of a, an awakening, uh, a development of a new consciousness that could allow an African-American person to uh, sort of change their way of thinking, uh, become more self-possessed and empowered. And there would be, you know, event, you know, uh, other steps that would then follow um, as a result of that. So that's kind of the larger framework that uh, the slave insurrection fits inside of here. Um, and McGann also mentions that Delaney, although he did not uh, take part in any armed uprisings himself, uh, he did not necessarily oppose the idea of armed uprisings. Um, he did aid John Brown and uh, the raid on Harper's Ferry, but he declined to actually participate in the action. So he was involved in the planning stages, but he was not physically present uh, for the event itself. Uh, but he was also influenced by other black abolitionists like Henry Highland Garnett, uh, who called for armed uprisings, essentially called for slaves to take up arms against their masters. And there's also a very important text that you guys might want to uh, Google. Uh, it is written by this guy, David Walker, in 1829. I think it was maybe first published in 1830, called The Appeal in Four Articles, sometimes referred to as David Walker's Appeal in Four Articles. Um, very sort of incendiary text, a call for emancipation, a call for equality, um, and coming out when it did, you know, right around 1830, 
uh, at a point where the abolitionist movement had not gained as much steam as it would in later decades. I mean, Walker like literally was putting his life on the line. There were bounties put out for him uh, simply for the offense of publishing the book. <laughs> um, you know, rewards were offered for his capture. Uh, he kind of had to go on the run. Um, that's how uh, scared, frankly, white audiences were. That's how scared the white power structure was, particularly in the South. So these currents are going on. They're all around uh, the culture at this time. Not always spoken of, uh, like I said, in polite white society, but certainly Delaney and other African-American intellectuals were having these conversations. They were writing editorials. They were uh, having these debates about what to do. How do we achieve our goals? Uh, what does the future look like. So he's influenced by other writers and thinkers, but he's also got his own plans, his own argument to make. So I just wanted to kind of wrap up by talking a little bit about slave insurrections kind of more generally. We can obviously revisit a lot of this next week when we actually jump into the novel. But again, there's a long legacy of slave insurrections, particularly in the South. Uh, and they were usually put down quite brutally. But I've mentioned a few of these already when we were talking about Melville. So I mentioned Nat Turner's rebellion, also called the Southampton uh, Rebellion. That happened in Virginia in 1831, somewhere between maybe, I don't know, like 10 or 20 uh, white people were killed. Nat Turner was the leader. Uh, he was later captured and, of course, executed. He has since then become a literary character at times. Uh, he actually functions in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, you guys might want to Google Nat Turner uh, while you're looking more into this. We also mentioned Haiti. Uh, and the history of Haiti, the fact that slaves did rise up and basically kicked out the French colonists who had been oppressing them. Uh, they killed many of those colonists and later defeated the French army uh, to become the first independent black republic in the New World. And of course, they were uh, reviled by most of the white world and not recognized as an independent country by the U.S. or Western Europe. Um, again, if we're wondering why Haiti remains one of the poorest countries in the world, the U.S. and Western Europe and the revenge that we sought after their rebellion uh, has a lot to do with it, uh, according to most historians. I'm no expert, but just based on what I've read and what I've been taught. So clearly those things were still fresh in Americans' minds. Haiti is not that far from the U.S. geographically. So you can imagine that some white southern slaveholders were a bit nervous at the prospects of something like that happening here. And you guys probably already know this. I know we've all taken history classes, but you got to remember, in a lot of parts of the South, uh, there was a huge African-American majority. Now, of course, that was largely enslaved populations. But in places like where I'm from in South Carolina, the low country of South Carolina, where Blake also visits, he goes to Charleston in this book. I used to live in Charleston. Uh, in places like that, where there were really big plantations and a huge sort of slave, sort of a slaveocracy, as it's sometimes called, Often uh, blacks outnumbered whites by huge, huge numbers, you know, two to one, three to one. So you had this really interesting, this strange power dynamic where you had these very small but powerful groups of white landowners and politicians, uh, the power structure, but then they were outnumbered vastly outnumbered by the enslaved populations. So that's why they did not want the slaves to be literate. That's why they gave the slaves very little in the way of, you know, possibilities of gaining any kind of uh, political power or social power that might make 
a rebellion even more possible. So uh, this was kind of a constant ongoing process to make sure things like this did not happen. And if we're just thinking a little bit more about South Carolina, uh, there, there's a whole subset of slave rebellions that I learned a little bit about growing up, not in school, mind you. Uh, they didn't really teach us this in school. I learned it from my mom, who's a history teacher, and would also give me the history that I wasn't going to learn in South Carolina public schools. Uh, so the Stono Rebellion was a famous one back in the colonial period in the low country of South Carolina. That was put down. Uh, but again, that was in the early stages of colonialism. So it was viewed as a major threat, much like Native American warfare was still a big threat before um, there was a really large white population. And then more important for this book, we move ahead to 1822 and Denmark Vesey who was actually a free African-American in Charleston, a carpenter. He bought his own freedom. He was born into slavery, but he acquired his freedom and was able to then go and work for himself. He also became a community leader. He was a little bit of a prophet type figure, kind of like Nat Turner, kind of like Blake. Blake is very much modeled after these real life analogs. Vesey was organizing something known only as The Rising. But uh, we, we don't have time to talk about this in a lot of detail, but it's endlessly interesting. And there's a good Wikipedia page on it. Uh, so you might want to check it out. But Vesey's uprising never led to any bloodshed. It was supposedly put down before it could actually get started. So nobody got hurt. No white people were injured or killed. Uh, Vesey and his compatriots were captured. He was, of course, executed. Uh, as was always the outcome. We saw it with Babo. We saw it with Turner. Um, I, I used to go to school right down the street from where Denmark Vesey, Vesey was executed. Uh, he was probably killed largely for political reasons. Uh, historians now think that there was very little evidence to indicate that what he was plotting was actually going to be a violent uprising. It's not clear, but it seems like the white power structure of Charleston, which is a very old colonial city on the South Carolina coast, a big seat of power within the Confederacy. It's where the Civil War started. <laughs> Fort Sumter is right off the coast of Charleston, so that's where the first shots were fired. South Carolina was the first state to secede you know, from the Union. So in Charleston, the seat of old Southern political and social power, uh, the powers that be said, we, we got to get rid of Vesey, not because he's violent and dangerous, but because he was a charismatic community leader and an early leader in the AME church. So if any of you have been to the South, or if you know a little bit about the South, you might know what that is. That, that stands for the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME. If you've ever gone to the South, you've probably seen a lot of AME churches. Uh, this was the first independent black Christian denomination in the U.S. And to this day, the AME church has a fair amount of political and sort of, I guess, cultural and social influence within a lot of African-American communities in the U.S., particularly in the South. Uh, not to get morbid, but some of you might remember that terrible church shooting that took place in Charleston, South Carolina, I want to say five or six years ago. Dylan Roof, a young white man, went into an AME church and killed many people because he wanted to spark a race war. He was some kind of Nazi white supremacist type. Uh, that was an AME church that he targeted. And there's a very, again, in the South, it's not just, oh, this is a church where a lot of African Americans attend. The church also represents a lot of their own sort of culture, history, community. Uh, so Roof was targeting it very deliberately. And that, particularly, that particular uh, AME church that he attacked was one of the older ones in Charleston. And again, not to make it about myself, but I used to live close to there. So it hit pretty close to home for me. Obviously, I did not attend. I can't claim to really share or even fully understand that culture. But as a Southerner, you're just aware of it. It's always there. There's always an AME church in any town or city in the South that you go to. Uh, it's just kind of a staple of 
Southern life. And, and uh, Vesey was involved in establishing the AME church in Charleston. And the white power structure wanted to get rid of him probably more for that reason than for anything having to do with an insurrection. But it's taken us until fairly recently to kind of make that discovery. And now you can find monuments to Denmark Vesey if you travel to Charleston. That was obviously not the case uh, in previous eras. So again, there's a long tradition here, a long history that Delaney is definitely utilizing in his novel, and he's commenting on it. At times, he even explicitly mentions some of these earlier uprisings. So let's keep that stuff in mind as we get started. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. This will be the end of part one, and we'll come back in part two and talk about some of our assignments.